timeline, you'll be able to do it right here in the session view and launch your clips, have them go through cool little progressions that lead to buildups. So uh, what's happening, it's like around 12.04. Give me a second to get my uh, monitor screen up so I can see your questions and comments. I'll fire off a couple little risers just guessing what's gonna come out from my risers list. Ooh, that one's changing. Bing, bing, bing. Uh, what are we doing? It is um, kind of part of Escape the 8 Bar Loop. This is one of the things I do to make tracks in session view so I can fire off clips, have them change into something else and lead me through progressions in the track like intros and buildups and all that kind of stuff. I think you got the idea. I've been talking about it since last week. Today we're gonna go kind of a little deep on just one detail about how to make your clips more interesting with some envelope automation that you might know, you might not know, but you get to watch and hang out, you know. Click to expand, how's my audio? Yeah, there's audio. Uh, give me a hello. Let me know where you are, who you are, if you can hear me and hear the music. And we are going to dip right into full screen. So here we go. I got this track I've been working on um, since I made, I started this track in like 2018 and I had it on hard drive forever and I pulled it out and I want to go through the basic process I do to start finishing a track. This is all about how to finish your music. And, um, the first thing I did was just the fun stuff where I made a whole bunch of clips and scenes and got something that sounds like this. It's got layers, it's got sounds, you know, bass line, all that kind of thing. And then I organized my sounds into basic groups with bus groups. So I've got the lows over here, kick drum and sub, stereo group of all my percussion so I can make a stereo mix. Notice that percussion channel is blue on top and all these blue ones are going into that track. They're all assigned to the percussion bus because I like using bus groups. And then I've got this uh, gray color thing with instruments. So you can see in the routing, everything going to instruments is colored the same color up top. So I can easily see what sounds are in which channels and I can get my hands on them and mix them. That's the first step for me to get, to, to easily finish producing the track and make it turn into something done. So I don't have to go looking for channels. I don't have to go looking for sounds. I can find them all and see what they are. The next thing I did was I went down every track and I found the clips that I want to use in the future. So like up here are experimental ones. Maybe the note length was different. Maybe the quantization was a tiny bit different. And as I went through going downwards, you know, downwards, like the bottom is the most recent. So the bottom line was all the clips I want to keep. Like this one says deep only up and down, you know. So I went through all of these and these are all the final versions. I cut and pasted them and put them up top in what I call clip stacks, which are kind of fun. Let me give you an example of a clip stack with this percussion channel. I'll put a kick drum in with a bass line so you can hear what these are doing. Now take a listen. I'm gonna point out this channel. So clip number one, okay. Clip number two, another sound comes in. Clip number three, little bongo comes in. And then clip number four, a, cl a clap comes in. So I can layer these in with another drum loop and get the track to be more interesting. So like at a beginning section, I could have just that hi-hat. When it's time for something to happen, add in another sound, get more excited, add in some bongos. And then for the peak, I wanna have everything happening, doom, doom, like that. So I like to make layers to play with to introduce new sounds over time. Maybe every eight bars a new, some new sound comes in, maybe every four bars. And to really signify when that's gonna happen, we're gonna use risers. And that brings us to the topic of today, clip envelope. You can see this clip is labeled the Hoover envelope sound, and the other one is just a straight one. Let me play the straight one and look at the audio file and you'll kind of like see what the sound is doing. So it's a siren. It's like, yay, siren's happening, something's gonna happen. And it just loops. That siren is okay. You could just use a volume you know, fade to bring that sound in and out. And that would work to tell people, hey, something's happening. At the end of this little phrase, we're gonna drop a new beat. But when I'm mixing and performing and playing, maybe I don't wanna have my hand on this volume control to do that sound. Like I might have other things to do, you know? So 
I made an envelope on this to change that sound over time so I don't have to do it manually with my hand on a control knob or my mouse on a fader or something. Now watch what happens when it loops and listen. Something different happened the second time through. You see the audio file is looping. And that high pass filter is doing something that goes in an eight bar chunk, even though the audio file is only four bars long. How do we do that? That is totally cool. That's what I can show you right now. And the especially cool thing is that it happened right here in the session view. So I did not have to go over to the arrangement and draw in breakpoints and make my filters move over time with all that kind of nonsense. No, it's not nonsense, it's, it's useful. But I didn't have to do that. I did it all right here in session view. And here's how, you go to this little button down here to open the envelopes view. Now you can see a red line and you can put in breakpoints for any parameter that comes out of the envelopes window. So the easy way to do this is pick the envelope or pick the parameter you wanna change. For me was the high pass filter frequency and just click on it and once it's highlighted, this field updates with that exact parameter, EQ8, band one, frequency A. See how cool it is? If I wanna automate this on off switch for that frequency band, I just click on it, and then I do shift tab to get back to my envelopes view, and it selects the EQ8 plugin, band one, filter on, filter on off, so I could automate, automate the on off switch. Uh, if I wanted to automate auto filter and envelope, I click on that, and look what happens. The window says, oh, you're in the auto filter plugin, and you want to do the envelope modulation. So this is the easy way to do it. So we're going to go click on, we're in band one, we have it set to high pass, we're going to click on the frequency control. And now look what we have. We have an automation envelope that's going to move that frequency control over eight bars. So that red line is going up, that frequency control is going up. Let me know if that makes sense. Hikam Labudi, Labudi. Sorry if I'm not saying your name right, but let me know if this makes sense. Type in yes, if that makes sense. What we're doing is this red line is going up and that's mapped to this frequency control. And watch what else is happening. The resonance is changing. So I click on resonance, do shift tab, and I get a picture of the resonance envelope. So I just, you know, I made it go up and down a little bit to make the sound change over time, which is super fun because now I can have multiple things changing during the course of this, this riser sound, and I don't have to control them by hand on, the, on my push or my controller or with my mouse or whatever I have. I, I do like tweaking things by hand, but you can't tweak everything, and we're gonna have a lot of sounds and a lot of automation going on. And by using clip envelopes, it lets us develop complex sounds so we can go through our session, launch scenes, and put this complex stuff in every scene. So we could have like every channel could have some automation happening to make the sounds change over time. Hey Samir, how you doing? And you know you don't have 29 hands to do all these different controls, so we can use automation to do it. So let me um, talk about this envelope loop function. Now I did this in a special way. The, the resonance is on a four bar loop. The knob moves, goes up and down, and the automation is gonna start over right there. But what's different about the frequency loop so like that one is that this loop is going for eight bars so it doesn't reset and go back down and the way to do this is with this loop link function if you have the loop linked then whatever length your audio file is in the normal looping parameter the loop is on and the length is four bars so the audio file is four bars it plays a four bar loop when we open the envelopes window it's automatically going to be linked to give you a four bar envelope loop but since I wanna make this filter sweep happen over the course of eight bars, I can unlink this and I get the option to make whatever length I want. Eight bars, maybe I wanna do a crazy long 16 bar loop where it starts a build up and then it's like, oops, tricked you, it came back down. And then we could do another build up towards nine bars. It goes all the way up to the top and then comes back down. And another one up to 13. What shape is this? Sawtooth wave. And finally, another one up to 16. So now we have a riser that goes every four bars. Let's make it fun and give it a little curve. So I'm going to hold down Option, drag down with the mouse, and do some curve shape. I wonder if I could right-click on a breakpoint. Ah, oh, I can. Ooh. 
Um, see, that's even more fun. <laughs> so now I can get some other kind of shapes happening. And let's hear how that sounds. So what I did was I made a modulation envelope that's gonna go 16 bars. So the loop is gonna play through four times of the audio and the frequency is gonna change all over the place during that four bars. So let's let that play through. There's our high pass filter moving. And it came back down. Now I could kind of use two windows. And then it starts over again. So let's put this to work with some sounds. And now as that riser moves, I can use that as a clue when to launch a sound. So every time the uh, filter sets over, sets, sets, resets to a low frequency, I'm gonna drop a new clip. So I'm using that as a little cue where the riser is, uh, it's going up, it's changing, it's going from low to high, and then every time it resets back down to the bottom, I was dropping a new sound. Now, I don't wanna keep this on 16 bars. I wanna have it be just a straight eight bar thing so it's um, predictable and it goes with kind of the way I'm planning to build this track. These don't really need to be there. You could do a right click, clear all envelopes. Let's redo that again, unlink. Loop envelope is going to be eight bars long. We are on, what parameter are we on? Oh, let me go double check. I want to do the EQ8 band one high pass filter. So I click on that. It starts at 125 hertz. Okay, good enough for me. Drop in another point, stretch it up to 22, and let's bend that a little bit to like a sort of para parabolic shape. So that when I uh, play this eight bar, <laughs> envelope. <gasps> Gotta label it so you know, so you don't forget and delete it. Now, like we've been hearing, this frequency is slowly going to rise over eight bars with some resonance sweeping around. And there you go. Five or ten minutes. I just showed you how to do that. And it's super fun. You can do this with any sound. Let's check out a couple other examples. Here's white noise one, two, and three. I'm not even sure what's going to happen. Let's hear it. Aha. All right, so the audio file is not looped. It's a one shot kind of a riser. Let's see what happened in our automation. We have an auto filter on here, bandpass filter shape, the frequency is going up and the resonance is also going up. Ooh, and the filter drive looks like that was going up too. How do I, how do I actually look at these parameters? Well, I click on the parameter, I do shift tab to get back to my envelopes and check it out. I click this little thing to open the envelopes view and when I click on the parameter that I want to inspect on here, which is first filter frequency, auto, the envelopes window selects it for me. So it goes straight there to auto filter and picks the frequency control. And notice these red dots. These are really useful because they show you which envelopes are automated. And you can go down here. If you want to only see those little red dots, you can click only show adjusted envelopes. Doop. Now in my drop down menu, it's a lot smaller. I can see, oh, I adjusted auto filter frequency, resonance, and drive. So here's our frequency envelope, which is going, aha, that's an eight bar envelope, but our sound was only four bars. That might have been a little bit of a mistake. So let's loop our sound again. That means the audio file is gonna continue looping so our envelope can go for eight bars and we can hear that filter sweep to its highest point. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, two. And there you go. Everybody's heard white noise risers a million times. Uh, before I started this lesson today, I uh, resampled this white noise. So originally this was just plain old white noise going shh. And I put in a sidechain compressor from the kick drum. So it makes it shut up on the beginning of every kick drum beat. 
and that gives the white noise riser the pulse, and I recorded it. So I get that whoosh, 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 kind of a rhythmic sort of sound. And that's good enough by itself, that's cool and it's fun, but hey, why not automate a couple other things? So let's look at what our resonance is doing. How do I find that envelope again? I click on the parameter resonance that I wanna see. I do shift tab, open up my envelope window, and there's auto filter with resonance. And what's happening? The resonance is not moving, why not? Oh my gosh, something's wrong, this is grayed out, what's going on? Well, I deactivated my automation. When I touched these parameters, the red dots changed to gray. The resonance is grayed out. It's not moving, nothing's happening. How do I get it back, what do I do? Ableton's broken, I broke live, oh my God. <laughs> no, I did not break live. You have to hit this little switch which is called return to automation, re-enable automation. Up at the top, don't get confused. It's easy to get lost with live. There's a couple of things that, that throw people off. All you have to do is re-enable your automation with this switch, doink, and the line turns red, buttons turn red, and now we can look at our resonance automation. Nothing too exciting there, it's just going up and down, but I kind of like that sine wave thing when I do a right click on here. So let's, um, let's just play with some of those. Let's see, I don't know, is that gonna be good? Whoa. That is not, that's not good, that's too much. Let's let it play through again. Remember, resonance is like adding vol volume at the filter frequency. So I'm thinking we want to have high resonance at the end and low resonance on the way there. All right, that'll work for me for now. I don't need to get too crazy into it. This loop is interesting, that was sort of back before the beginning of the one. All right, whatever. So I think you get the idea. And then I also automated the drive just to basically add volume as it goes through and give it some crunch with the, uh, the OSR filter model. So we can see our drive is going up. And maybe we could add even more than 15. So, Oh, what did I do? I just bypassed all that stuff. Let me re-enable. Doink. So re-enable up on top of there. So let me check in visually. Hey, what's happening? It's me. So um, what are the basic principles of making a riser? If you're doing sound design and you want to have your sounds signify that something interesting is happening in the track, number one, volume. Just start it off a little bit quiet, ramp it in so it gets louder and louder and louder and takes over your whole awareness. And that's going to be an interesting transition sound. Number two, frequency aka pitch. If you start at a low frequency and have it go up, it's like taking it up, literally taking people up to like a higher level in the track, whatever. Might sound cheesy, but it really works. So we got volume, we got frequency, we got pitch. Um, and then the intensity of modulation. So if it starts off with a little bit of a pulse, like have that get more exaggerated. So it ends up being like foot, 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 foot. Like whatever modulation parameters you have, you can exaggerate them more towards the end of your transition sounds and it'll get better. So like we were looking at resonance, it starts off low and then gets more and more pointy, bright, shrill, screechy, whatever, as we go through the riser. That's a, a general theory of sound design is like take your sounds at, for when you're making a transition like a riser, exaggerate them over eight bars and anything you have to work with, if you do those things, it'll sound good. So you make it louder over time, you make it go up in pitch over time, you can make it widen out in stereo or go back and forth and then exaggerate that. So if it starts in the center, by the end of those eight bars, have it be going like, doof, 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 like ping pong. Um, just a little bit of general theory of how to design transition sounds. I wanna do a couple more of these because I have some sounds that um, I didn't even work with. So let's just see, what did White Noise 2 sound like? Oh, we just did that one. Let's check out White Noise 3. I think I went for full on resonance craziness right here. Yeah, elevator going up. <laughs> All right, so that kind of just goes with what I was um, saying about general principles, volume, pitch, frequency. Uh, here's one I said delete and why. Oh. I think I didn't like the, uh, the micro timing on that one. Eh. 
Maybe I'll leave it there. Let me know if you like that sound. Tell me if I should delete this riser or not. It feels like it's... You know what I'm gonna do with this one? I'm gonna do something simple. I don't like the tone of the auto filter on that riser. So I wanna to go to the auto filter power switch, device on off. Can I do that? Wait a minute. I wanna to get to the auto filter on off. Device on, yeah, okay. So device on and device off and make sure that it's gonna be definitely off anywhere that I encounter it right there. And that might mean I need to turn on the other ones. Okay, I like that sound better with this auto filter off. Now what if I'm using a riser in the same channel? Ah, oh, look at that. I'm getting so smart. My automation is still happening, but the stupid thing is off. So if you're gonna have multiple layers of automation in the same channel, Unfortunately, you gotta go back to your other clips now and put in the device on command to make sure that all these other clips are gonna have the auto filter working when you hit that clip. Fortunately, this is really not that hard. You go through and drop a breakpoint. The mysteries of automation, so let's check it and make sure. I fire that clip, auto filter's off. Okay, so that was cool. We kind of encountered a little problem, doing a little problem solving. So this one is gonna be resurrected because we didn't delete it. And let's make it a little bit of a yellow color. All right, so now we're gonna get into some fun stuff. I might just go totally experimental. Let me know if you have any questions right now. I'm always happy to answer questions, but please make sure you only ask questions if I know the answer. Because <laughs> teachers hate to say they don't know. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm not like that at all. If I don't know, I'll just tell you. Uh, ask me anything you want. Right now, let's play through this little list of glitchy kind of sounds and see what they turn into. Okay, here we go. Do the risers, hey Tom, how you doing? Do the risers just abruptly end when the loop ends or do you use a sort of transfer or reverb afterwards to smooth it out? Uh, both. So yes, I use reverb and some delay effects on the risers to make a bridge and smooth it out. But um, I like when they end so that the drop is clean most of the time. Like this one that we were just saying, the resurrected one, right? Maybe you asked that question because I put the end point here at bar nine, so it stops. Now, there are times when, like if I'm, go it, the answer is it depends on what the next section is. So if I'm going into a drop with like a cymbal crash and a kick drum and the main break, like the main drop of the track, then I would probably do something like this and have it be nice and clean so because I want the attention to be on the beat and maybe the vocal or whatever. But if we're using this riser to lead into a breakdown, then yeah, definitely. I want that smooth ramp kind of a shape where it builds up and then this whole tail, that will lead people into the breakdown where there's no beats and there's emptiness and space and you need that ramp to come through. So the answer is uh, the risers, the end of the riser depends on what section you're going into next. Cool question. What can we do with these? Let's see what we got. Oh. All right, well, that's a nice little short one. What do we uh, get if we loop it? Does that sound like a riser yet? I like to look at it on the spectrum and see what kind of shape is happening. And I think I want to make a new channel already. I already got that feeling like I'm going to be doing some different plugins. <laughs> so let's just take these right over here so I don't mess up these risers. In other words, I want to, I want to actually use these, the ones we just built. I want to use those in the track and I don't want to um, risers too. I want to do some other sound design stuff with these and not destroy the other ones. Oh, Samir, can you show how you have arranged the kick with the bass after risers? Ooh, serious business, kick drum and bass line. Does anybody else want to see kick drum and bass? Type in kick if you want some low end stuff. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. And uh, we can do that. I almost always drop an auto filter because these are bassy sounds and I don't want to have my low end getting blown out. So that one is just going to be a high pass filter just for kind of like protection of the sound. And what else did I say we were doing? How about um, an auto pan? This is a, a nice one that's easy to work with. 
and it can get a pretty dramatic sound pretty quick. my starting place, like this, and, and I want to get to there. So we're automating the amount knob first. So I go to my clip, shift tab, find the automation envelopes, joink, and look at that. I'm already selected on the auto pan plugin with the wet dry amount. I don't want it to start at 100 because then there's nowhere to go. So I start it at zero. And what was that other thing about making the envelope happen over a longer duration. Unlink the envelopes. Select command up arrow a couple times. Oh, 412, no. 400, oh, oh, boink. Now I've got a four bar automation envelope so that, so that over the course of four bars that auto pan wet dry will slowly ramp in. I love watching this one, it looks so cool. <laughs> So like that, and maybe one little more little thing. What if we change the rate? Oh, the rate boxes are so interesting. We also want to unlink that one. And can I make that four bars long? Oh, Rado's here. Hey, how you doing? I'm glad that worked out with amping up your uh, synth sound. Um, for some reason, this automation envelope is not behaving the way I thought it should. So maybe I'll skip that. Yeah. Oh, right, okay. Unlinked four bar. Yeah, there we go. And if I want to end up at the 148th, which is like the fastest one, what if I start off at like a slow quarter note? This can get super nerdy, but I'll keep it on there and then ramp it through like that. Something like that. So I don't know, a little bit of glitchy risers and stuff. And I have the feeling I could play with these all day. So <laughs> maybe I'll go and do the um, kick drum and bass line thing. Cause that's a pretty quick demonstration. Wow, hello. I love those stereo things. Those are almost perfect risers just by themselves if I just loop them. So the question is, exactly, Steve, what did I do with the kick and bass drum after the riser? Step one, I put them together in one bus group. And let me uh, just fire off a chunk of song where, it's, where we're using those. And thank you for the compliment. I'm glad you think the kick and bass drum sound good because that means <laughs> they sound good on the other end. Um, so. You know, color coding and grouping isn't the most, most important thing, but for my workflow, I did put both of these into the low bus group, and um, I probably did a bunch of processing on each one by itself. So the first thing I did, I remember, was I cut the tail off this kick drum because I wanted it to be a shorter duration and not be like, this, okay? You can see that big low bump at the bottom comes in a tiny bit after the click on the front of it. And that's a cool sounding kick drum, but you know, you always have to cut it off a little bit to fit it down in the rest of the track. So, I cut off some of that. And that's not even that clean of an edit. You can hear some high frequency on there, but Kind of doesn't matter right there. Am I being lazy? I am being lazy. Let's let's clean that up. I hear a click at the end. I don't want that click. So already right there, 
The kick drum is a shorter duration, which is important because this bass line is a big, long, dubby bass line that takes up a lot of room. So I want that kick drum to punch through and get out of the way. Then um, I did a bunch of EQing, a lot of it to cut off the low end and scoop it up to about 65 hertz, which shows up over here on the spectrum. Put the mouse on the arrow, right around 65 is the low bump. The reason I did that is because the notes in the bass line leave some empty space. With those three notes, root, fifth, and octave, the top note is E, around 84, 82, 83. Bottom note is also E, around 42 hertz. So I don't want to have a low kick drum at 42 because it's going to be doubling up the power of that, that kick drum and it'd be like, or the bass line, it'd be kind of too much low end. And I don't want to fight against the one up at 80. And I also, that thing around 61 right there, I don't know, that's a note in the bass line that's important. So I tried to just EQ my kick drum and put it right here in the gap around 65, 70 hertz. That's super techy, and you know, you could argue that it's like I'm going too crazy with it. But I want to make them fit together and I want them to fit in a frequency space together. So let's even put that up to 70 hertz. Try and make an EQ bump. And notice band five right here is at what? 80 hertz. So I'm carving out space for my kick drum to allow the bass drum to pop up. Another important EQ, EQ location is right here at 126, which is uh, how you can make your kick drum sound good on a smaller sound system. So right here we have a little bump popping up in the 120s so that it's got that like the body of the kick drum is like pop, pop, pop. Down here at 70, 60 is the, uh, the lower thump, like the power of the kick drum. And then up here around 2000 is that click kind of thing where it's like tick, tick, tick that tells you exactly, exactly the micro rhythm of where it's coming through in the beat so you can hear it. So that's my EQ theory on kick drum. Let's look at bass line. Let me know if I'm going too fast or if you have any other questions. I love talking about kick drum and bass lines. I could do it on every song. What was our starting bass sound? It's coming from operator. It looks like we had a triangle wave, hooray, with a low pass filter. <laughs> All right, so side chain's happening. Let's undo that. Glue compressor, boosting some gain and EQ. Let me make sure that the, um, the low bus group there. Okay, so I had some EQ and compression in. Now this might have gotten a bunch quieter, but we'll get that back in a second. So there's our basic sub bass sound. Hey, Julian James, sound design master over there. Uh, I was still thinking about what you told me with parallel bus group compression. Julian, like last, about a year ago, we were talking about bus groups having a parallel compression with everything in there, like the whole track in one bus group and then side chaining the crap out of it with the kick drum. That was pretty damn interesting. If you ever wanna do a workshop and go live and show us your sessions with that kind of parallel compression strategy, might be fun. All right, so this, this sub bass, man, triangle wave. Modulation opportunity. <laughs> Filter it down to like 250 and you're good. And I kick in an EQ, high pass filter around 40 hertz. Why? Because that lowest note was right around 40 hertz at the note E down there. And I don't need very much else happening there. There is some overtone stuff happening. Oh, 70 hertz. Why is there a notch? Because that's where the kick drum goes. It's like a zipper. I'm literally boosting up frequencies on one sound and cutting out the opposite frequency on the other one. So right here where on the bass line, there's a notch at 70 hertz on the kick drum. We had a boost at 70 hertz, except it's on band one. So interlocking frequencies, zippering your sounds together. Make them play nice. So filter, EQ, compression, mostly for the makeup gain. I don't really need to compress this. And then once we have the level up, side chain happening, kick drum input, I like to exaggerate stuff. Make sure I can really feel what's happening. Now we get those two together. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, if you're not, it's one of those things where you need experience to understand it, but you can't understand until you have the experience. 
when it comes to leveling, the question is like, how loud should my kick drum be? How do I build up a mix? What's my gain staging supposed to look like? Let me show you what I do. I start with my buses. If I, if I was gonna tear down this mix and make everything like start over, I would put these all at minus 12. So that question yesterday about mix templates, this is in my head, bus groups at minus 12, master channel at zero. I never change my master channel volume. I leave that at zero. None of that craziness of like, you know, bringing stuff up and down in the master. So let's turn off master channel effects. All I got is spectrum. Low end bus group is at minus 12. Why? Because if I wanna make this louder, I want space with the fader to go up. Now I'm gonna start with my kick drum. I said I'm gonna start with my kick drum. <laughs> And what I'm going for is somewhere around minus 15 on the master. Let me check comments. Julian said, except the drums, are you out of your mind? And now I'm confused. I want to know how you do it. Tell me all your secrets. Um, okay. <laughs> Gabor, hey, question. Usually I like to put a compressor to a bit. Hold on, let me read this question. Compressor on the bass and sidechain it to my kick to give the bass a bit of movement. It makes kick more dominant. What if you want to make one instrument dominant over everything else? <clears throat> Do you need to make a billion compressors everywhere? Actually, no, this is a weird question that, believe it or not, if you have one compressor on your whole master channel, then whatever is the loudest sound in your mix is gonna come to the front and make everything else drop out. It's really weird. If you, it's like, if you have like, let's say you have a lead vocal and then all the other music in the track, if you put your lead vocal way up louder than everything else, so it's way too loud, but then you compress the crap out of your master channel, the lead vocal is gonna sound like it's side-chaining everything else because that's just how compressors work. They take the input signal and duck everything when it happens. So no, you don't need to have a, a billion side-chain compressors, compressors, but you might wanna try using bus groups so that if you're talking about like one instrument dominant over everything else, you could have that instrument in, have all the instruments in your instrumental group. Take the one that you want dominant, literally turn it up really loud and then have a hard compressor, compressor with low threshold, and it's gonna make the whole thing work. It's, you have to play with it and hear it to, to feel how that happens, but compressor thresholds and the way they work is really a pretty amazing thing. So I was talking about gain staging, building up a mix with kick and bass line. Um, also, I have my kick drum starting here around minus six, so I have room to go up and make adjustments. And my master channel is around minus 18. I was thinking minus 15, so I don't know. Let's go up to around here. And there's my shape. Now what I'm gonna do is unmute the bass and fade it up until I can hear it and feel it blend with the kick drum. Now I can hear that, I can feel it coming through and on the master spectrum, I can clearly make out. I see the kick drum bump underneath there and I still see those three baseline notes that I know are the loudest ones. Now, I, I don't wanna tell you to do this visually because it's not a visual art, it's an audio art, but sometimes a spectrum analyzer really does help. Again, there's our kick drum shape, there's our little notch for that baseline note. And there's our baseline note popping up right in that notch, I love it. So that's our basic mix of kick and bass only coming up around minus 16 on the master channel. Got lots of room to add in, this might get loud, add in some low end boost and some compression to glue these two together. So the kick and the bass are functioning like a unit. And now you can see we still got nine, 10 dB of headroom. Plenty of space to add in all our other sounds. Let me get them all. And remember, don't unmute if you change your whole mix. Bring the volume down before you open the channel. And now that I have this drum group, this is a great illustration of bus groups because I can easily find the right level for the whole entire percussion kit with one fader and keep it working compared to the kick and bass. And one of my favorite things is what I call faders down, monitors up. All right, let me um, have a little camera visit. Faders down, monitors up. The problem we're having right that we're about to run into is that I want this track louder. I wanna feel it louder. I wanna feel that kick drum thumping. I know I'm in headphones right now, but if I was in the speakers, there's that point when I'm like, yeah, it's cool, but I want it loud. I wanna really have it feel like music. The mistake is to just take all my buses and jack them up louder. 
That's not the right way to do it because the loudness, you will feel it, but then if your instrument group is not loud enough, you're gonna run out of headroom and you won't have any place to raise up level. What if your reverbs are not loud enough or you have something else coming in? So it's a mistake to take your first sounds and turn up the channel groups louder. What you should really do is keep your faders down Take your monitor volume, which in this case is my headphones, <laughs> and turn it up. Literally on the board, you'd be like, you don't want to go like this and turn your channels up to get loudness. What you want to do is keep them grouped where they are, keep the main there, and go to your control room volume and turn up the volume in the control room to feel the loudness and feel like the bass is pumping and kicking and really getting huge. That's a fundamental shift that will make your mixing so much better really fast because you just don't run out of headroom. Seriously, when, you, when I started doing shows, I was like this. All my channels were up like that. And then if my kick drum was over here and I was like, oh no, I just dropped the drop of my track and nobody can hear it and the kick drum's not thumping, I'd be like, bonk. Hear that? Top of the fader, top of the headroom, literally no more space to go. Channels might be clipping and you're screwed. You cannot get your kick drum to come through loudly and feel like it's banging if all your channels are maxed out and up to the top of the faders or whatever you're working with, you know, your digital, digital groups or VSAs or something. So keep your fader levels down, turn up your monitoring volume so it sounds loud, feels good, and your master channel still has tons of space for your other sounds. And this is a funny song. It's like a little, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> um, and now I have all this space, I can make this nice and loud and get those synths feeling bright, clear, wide, hear all the details in them. and they're all working. And by the way, for sneaky tricks, who's this little guy over here? That is a baseline double. Gabor says, thank you, I've copied your workflow and try to follow it, it helps to keep organized. Yeah, thanks, you know, I, I try to even practice what I preach and be as organized in all my sessions as I am when I'm teaching on mine, and uh, most of the time I am, but you know, if you look at my, my work in progress sessions, they are pretty all over the place. Because during the creative phase, you just throw in stuff and add it in there and then organize it later. Cool, yeah, thank you so much for watching. Anybody else, if you have a quick question, you could um, type it in real quick. It's uh, been about 45 minutes, so I'm gonna wrap this one up and uh, I don't wanna go on forever and ever and ever. If you came in later, what we did so far today was we played around with some riser sounds and some envelope automation so we can make these clips that change sound over the course of eight bars. Let me fire one off and my percussion group is not in, that's why. So there's our riser looping around. So every time the riser loops, I can drop in a new sound and it gets more interesting. Might not want to hear that riser quite that much. <laughs> and to get to the envelope automation, you open up the little envelope window. What is that officially called? That's called the envelopes box. You open that up, go to the parameter that you want to automate, click on it, and you get an automation field where you can put in sounds. Easy riser, cut the low end, wait for it to come around to the end. One, two, three, four. And that's looping. Whoa. That's the problem of using a super high resonance. It can self oscillate and make some noise. All right. Now I'm gonna turn this down for the end of the broadcast. Go back to camera land. Thanks for watching everybody. It is spring 2020. We are in quarantine and everybody's home, hanging out, doing whatever you're gonna do. There's some interesting um, messages I've seen from people in the art community that are saying like, you know, don't put too much pressure on yourself. You don't have to come out of the quarantine with like, you know, a master's in yoga and a black belt in Tai Chi and all kinds of shit or whatever. Like you don't have to do tons of work 
when you're at home right now. There's so much going on in the world. It takes a lot of energy to just talk to people, keep your spirits up, see what's going on, find out the news of what's going on because we don't know, it's never happened before, and feel connected to other people. It, it takes a lot more work to feel connected when you're in, a, in the same <laughs> house or apartment or room or building or whatever. So I wanna respect that for sure. Uh, I have to do it myself. I take time to like make something I like to eat and just sit down and like read through news, make some phone calls, answer some chats, have a video chat. All that stuff is really, really important to keep your vibes up. But at the same time, press pause on the news and give yourself an hour or two to make music as a way to relax. The really cool thing that I love about making music is that you know, I have goals and I'm like, oh, I do want to make progress. And it's like, I want to like check off tracks that I finished. But at the same time, when I come up here and fire up all my gear and, you know, open up the speakers and play some sound, for me, that's my relaxation time. That's when I'm like, I can forget about everything else. I don't have to do, I don't have to do my taxes. I don't have to like do anything else. And I can just like spend some time with creative music. And it really makes me feel better about everything in the Facebook group and in YouTube. And um, if you have any other ideas for topics or questions, please send them to me. I'm happy to make videos about reverb and compress it, compressing sounds and all kinds of stuff like that. So I'm looking forward to doing a bunch more of these live videos as we go on. And that's it for today. Tomorrow, more of the same. I'm not sure exactly what I'll tune in on, but it'll be something fun. All right. See ya. Thanks for watching.